The following talk was given at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, California. Please visit our website at audiodharma.org. Today's topic is wilderness teachings, the Thai forest tradition. The, the word ba in Thai, which is ordinarily translated as forest, actually means wilderness. And the wilderness monks that we're talking about. And when you hear about the forest tradition or the wilderness tradition, most people will hear about the style. No nonsense, down to earth, humorous, and very little about the substance. And what did the forest teachers teach? What was the substance of their teaching? What set it apart from other traditions? That's very rarely discussed. Um, there are several reasons for this. One is because it is an oral tradition, there's not that much that's recorded aside from talks that the monks gave at particular times. And it's a general policy of the tradition that you would give talks specifically to designed for the problems of the people who were there. As John Cha said, you know, he sees somebody turning left, he said, off, going, falling off the path to the left, he would say, go right, go right. Another group of people come, they're falling off to the left, he'd, you know, they're falling off to the right, he'd say, go left, go left. Um, and so it's hard to generalize from talks like that as to what their basic policy was or what their basic teachings were. Um, there's also the fact that they had what we should call sort of inside teachings and outside teachings, teachings for general public and then teachings for specific meditators. When someone would come to the Ajahn with a specific, specific question, you might get a very much more detailed teaching than you would, say, for the general talks. Um, another reason is that there is a tendency not only in American culture but also in Thai culture to try to reduce every Ajahn to a soundbite. Ajahn Chah is all about letting go. And John Mahabu is all about fighting the defilements. And as you look at their teachings in a, larger, in a larger context, you realize that they have lots of different teachings for lots of different circumstances. And it misrepresents them to reduce them to a soundbite. Then the final problem, of course, is with the Western tra transmission of their teachings. Um, because it's an oral tradition, it's hard to translate it sometimes properly into English or into English that makes sense in terms of sentences. Um, Many times they are addressing issues within Thai culture that the translators didn't know about. It's part of a, their teachings were part of an ongoing discussion that the Western translators, translators are only coming in on the tail end of the discussion, not knowing what's coming from. And there is also a tendency to, especially back in the 70s, to basically interpret them, interpret them as if they were Zen masters. People would get around after John Cha's talk in particular and say, well, what were the great Zen sayings he said today? Um, and there's a lot more going on besides just the Zen aspects. So, um, in order to counteract this tendency, I'd like to talk today about what were the more substantial teachings that, they, that the teachers, teachers gave, uh, particularly on issues that may be more or less controversial within the Theravada tradition. I'm going to be focusing on the teachings of three members of the tradition. One is John Munn, who is one of the founders of the tradition. Um, he left behind only a small body of written teachings. One was a poem that he wrote by Utkar in 1932, and nobody knew about it until after he died in 1949. It was found among his papers. He didn't have that many papers, but he just kept it in his bag, his shoulder bag. Um, the other two will be a John Lee and a John Mahabua. Because both of these are the ones who, more than anybody else in the tradition, wrote systematic books about the Dharma. Um, they're the more, most articulate, and they were the ones who kind of presented the overview of what the practice was all about. Um, first, though, I'd like to give you a little background on the forest tradition. The forest tradition grew out of a reform movement that happened in the early 19th century. It was called the Dhammayut, D-H-A-M-M-A-Y-U-T. It means um, in accordance with the Dharma. It started out as a, an urban reform movement. It was started by a prince who later became Rama IV. You probably know Rama IV as Yul Brenner and the king and I. <laughs> well, before he was king, he was a monk for 28 years. And the story goes that he became a monk right before his father, Rama II, died. And he was actually first in line for the throne. But in Thailand, the throne is, succession is not automatic. It's decided by the Privy Council. And the Privy Council decided that they liked one of his brothers better. So they chose the brother to be king. And so this prince, his name was Prince Mankut at the time, 
decided it might be best for him to stay as a monk. If he disrobed, there would be political intrigue issues, um, questions about you know, having been cheated out of the throne. So he stayed on as a monk for 28 years, and he decided as long as I'm going to be a monk, I might as well do a good job of it. However, he looked around where he was, which was the main temple right next to the Grand Palace in Bangkok, and began to, as he began to study the Vinaya, began to study the Dhamma, he began to realize that the practice, even at that temple, was pretty lax. Monks were openly, openly violating a lot of the, the minor rules. He said, if they're openly violating the minor rules, what about the major rules that they're doing in private? You know? And so he made a vow. He said, if there's any decent um, ordination lineage or training lineage left in Thailand, I want to know about it within seven days. The third day after that, he met a Mon monk who started talking about the Mon tradition. Now, the Mons are an ethnic group that live mainly in western Thailand and southern Burma. And they had a reform movement back in the 17th century, and they had been able to sort of maintain a record of ordination and teaching from that time on. And as Prince Mongkut quizzed this monk about the practice of the Vinaya, their understanding of the Dharma, he said, okay, this is the movement I've been looking for. So he went and reordained among the Mons um, and went to study with them. Now his brother, Rama III, said, this is kind of embarrassing, a, a Thai prince studying with the Mons. I'm trying to think of what would be a... It would be like a, you know, an heir to the British throne decided he wanted to study with some Irish people or something um, back in the 19th century. And so this is embarrassing. A Thai prince studying with the Mons. I will build you a monastery and you can do whatever reform stuff you want in, in the monastery. And so that was the beginning of the Dhammayud order. Now, after Rama III died, um, the question of Prince Mongkut having been passed over the last time around came up again. And they said, well, let's, as a kind of formality, we'll offer him the kingship again. Now, we expect he's been a monk for 28 years, he'll probably say no, and then we can give it to the prince that we really want to give it to. And so they went in, they made the formal offering of the kingship to him, and he said, okay, I will disrobe tonight, and we'll have the, start, the, uh, start the coronation tomorrow. Um, and so he became king. And after he became king, um, there was some concern among his courtiers, and you know, they're going to have to all ordain as Dhammayut, or, or have their sons ordain as Dhammayut monks. And he said, no, go ahead and continue supporting the monasteries that you have been supporting. Um, I don't want to, have, to feel any pressure to become Dhammayut. His concern was a lot, too many people came into this new reform movement. At that time, it was just about 12, 12 temples or so. Um, people coming in there for political reasons, uh, you might not get the best people or the best motivation. So he tried to maintain it as a separate place where the monks could study and practice. This reform was not only revival of the text, but also revival of meditation methods that are found in the Pali Canon. Um, when I first went to Thailand, I came across a book. It was a report that a Dutch merchant had made in the 17th century of Ayutthaya. Now, Ayutthaya was the old capital of Thailand um, uh, prior to Bangkok. And he'd gone around. They were kind of the early anthropologists, these Dutch merchants. And he had visited, he devoted one chapter to Buddhism. And his description, he went and interviewed monks, and they were talking about their meditation methods, and it was visualization, say, of the sun and the moon with the syllables of the sun and the moon visualized there and the different powers and things. And I kept saying, where did he get that information? This is before I knew anything about tantrism. Um, later I discovered, it, as I began to read about tantric meditation, that basically what was being done in the Ayutthaya period, we're talking about, 17th century, was, were tantric forms of meditation, the visualizations of the different beings, the different gods, trying to invite the different gods, or different powers into you. They would actually have a meditation where you would invite jhana into you. You'd bow down and present offerings of candles and incense to jhana um, in hopes that jhana would visit you. Uh, uh, when the you know, fell after the Burmese invasion, um, and then the Bangkok dynasty started, there was um, Rama the first had, had this policy of wiping out every every remnant of tantrism. All the old tantric altars were destroyed. A lot of tantric texts were destroyed. But it wasn't until Prince Mongkut sort of reviving interest in the Pali Canon that meditation that we take for granted as being you know Pali Theravada meditation, breath meditation, contemplation of the Buddha, contemplation of the body, um, recollection of death. That these actually became seriously practiced again. So the Dhamma movement was both a scholarly and a meditation movement. Um, Rama V died in the late 1860s. Uh, he was 
replaced by his son, Rama the Rama the Fourth died in the 1860s, and he was replaced by his son, Rama the Fifth. Rama the Fifth had a very different attitude toward Buddhism than his father. Um, his father had arranged for Western tutors to come in and, tra and train all the, the princes in the palace. And his attitude was, you know, the monks just sitting around meditating, they're not really doing that much for society. Thailand's big problem at that time, of course, was you had the French moving in from the east and the British moving in from the west and the south. And Thailand was sitting there, and the question in the French and British mind was exactly which parts of Thailand they were going to take. Um, as for the Thais, they said, ah, we don't want to be taken, thank you. So what to do? And so they, one of the policies was to establish a more centralized government. Prior, prior to that time, Thailand had been pretty much a feudal state. And part of centralizing the government also meant having a centralized education system. Now, how do you start an educational system from scratch? You don't have much funds in terms of funds. You don't have any trained teachers. You don't have any land. You go to the monasteries and say, can we have a little bit of your land for schools? And so the monasteries all over the country gave lands for schools. The question, next question is, can we have the monks teaching in the schools until we get trained lay teachers? So a whole generation of Thai monks suddenly found themselves pressed into being teachers. Can you imagine a John Munn training first grade teachers? <laughs> We're lucky he got out and he got out of the dragnet. At that point, you know, the, the rule of law in Thailand had not come, become quite as draconian as it could later become. And so what happened is if you didn't want to participate in this new program, you had to go out in the forest. And this is one of the reasons why we have a forest tradition. Um, now in the hinterlands, places like Ubon, Udon, Chiang Mai, the new policies coming out from Bangkok hadn't yet really been put into, into effect, but they were moving out in that direction. And at the same time, there was an emphasis on training the monks to be more and more scholarly. Rama V put, kind of put aside this whole issue of meditation or meditation reform. Uh, he actually ran up to some opposition with his new policy of getting the monks to be teachers. People saying, hey, we're pulling monks from their duty, which is to practice the Buddhist teachings, to practice meditation, to gain awakening. And he sent out some people to have quote unquote survey, which proved that nobody else was really nobody was actually really practicing meditation properly. No, of course, there was no way. There was jhana was no longer available. The time for jhana had passed. The time for nirvana had passed. The best thing monks could do would be to be teachers. Hmm. Yeah. Now, fortunately, this attitude had not yet got to Obon, in, which is where John Mun was and John Sao, his teacher. They were still operating under the <laughs> traditions established by Rama the Fourth, which was that you wanted to be both scholarly and a meditation monk. And John Sow said, "You know, I really don't want to be a scholarly monk. I really want to go for the meditation." And that was the beginning of what we now have as the forest tradition. Um, it was a peasant movement. This is one of the things I really like about it, in the sense that it was a movement that came up. It was actually was a grassroots movement, as the new. Orthodoxy was being spread out from Bangkok. This was a, a resistance movement to that. Now, resistance movements are not well regarded in Thailand. Um, fortunately, John Mudd had a friend who was a scholarly monk, very high placed scholarly monk in Bangkok, who would speak up for him whenever there was questions about this, about whether John Mudd was dangerous politically. Um, but you would see he was basically moving away from the general um, trend that was coming out from Bangkok at the time. He went into the forest as Things began to move into the northeast. He said, I need more seclusion, I need more quiet. He headed up to the north. Um, the, the, the movement has the tradition that he gained full awakening when he was up in the north part of Thailand. And then finally he returned to Isan, which is the, uh, the name for the northeastern part of Thailand. Lived out the last eight years of his life from 1941 to 1949. Again, in a very remote part of the, part of the country. Um, he was not that well known during his life. And there were some people, in, say through his friend in Bangkok, and some people he knew in Chiang Mai, who knew about the forest movement. Otherwise, it was totally a northeastern Thai movement, largely in the countryside. Um, so that's a little bit of the background to a John Mun's starting or, other, or playing a role in the starting of the teaching. Any questions about what I've said so far? Move the maker in. The. Uh, a lot of Westerns, Western scholarship about uh, wants to give the impression that there was a there was a severe break that, that 
oral tradition and meditation was broken, uh, citing people like that, colonialist historians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that conceivable? Well, I mean, you have the Mon tradition, which apparently kept both the meditation and the, and the scholarship alive, which is what Brahma IV studied in. Um, most of the Western scholarship I've seen on the Thai forest tradition I don't find reliable. There's one book by James Taylor called Forest Monks of the Nation State, which is probably the best book on the topic. So overall, overall they give the impression that, that, that Buddhism was lost, and these modern people, including us in the West, reinvented it. No, no, that's, you don't have that. that. Again, Robert the Fourth was trained with the Mons and was taking on there. There's always somebody off in the woods. Um, <laughs> And this, this is an important part of Theravada history. Is, I mean, there will be reform movements that will last for a gener usually up to three generations. And then you know, when you've got the merit of comedy, people are you know, really inspired by these movements. And they bring the monks in, or, that's, or they would go out to find the monks. And all of a sudden, these forest monasteries find themselves laid low with largesse. And then you get people coming in and joining the movement, not for, for less than honorable motivations. And so that reform movement will tend to die out, then you've got to go in the forest again and find another one. Now the riskiness of that, when you go in the forest, not everybody who's practicing in the forest is reliable. Because you have a lot of black magic practice going on in the forest, you have a lot of quasi-tantric practice going in the forest. The reason they're going into the forest is they want to do it secretly. And so this is one of the reasons that people don't go out into the forest unless there is a crisis of faith or a crisis, the sense that this, what they call the economy of merit, was breaking down. But there seems to be something, uh, kind of a, an ongoing tradition. It didn't really die. I uh, keep finding myself wondering, how many copies of the Pali Canon could there have been in existence at this time? Uh, it seems like the, the thread of continuity all through, you know, from shortly after the Buddha's time till... 19th century or 17th century must have been hmm. precarious. Well, in, as I said, Rama I was really a very pro Theravada and orthodoxy kind of person. As soon as he was able to establish himself in power, he sent out word we want to find all the copies of the Pali Canon we can find. And they got quite a few. And they brought them in and they, they, they actually had a, you know, what, would they, what they call it. Um, group study of the text to see you know, which versions were the most reliable. And this went on for several generations until finally in, in, under Rama V there was what the, the version that is now used in Thailand was finally established. And that had, had input not only from various editions around Thailand but also editions that were kept in Cambodia, kept in um, northern Burma, kept in southern Burma, kept in Sri Lanka. And so there were, you know, there were definitely there were copies around, let's put it that way. And finally, there was a um, reform movement in Burma, too, mm -hmm. late 19th century. Um, there were two reform movements. Two, okay. and, and was there cross-fertilization? No. Communication between no. Burma and Thailand? No, the Burmese had come in and they'd sacked Ayutthaya and they destroyed the city. Did they, you think the Thais wanted to talk to them? <laughs> <laughs> there was really no communication. Okay, thank you. The Burmese tend to also regard the Thais as monkeys, so it's... <laughs> I, I've, I guess I've kind of picked up some of the Thai prejudice on this issue, but um. <laughs> no, they were mainly in con conversation with the Sri Lankans. Okay. Mm. So, is tantric yoga meditation practice part of the forest meditation, no, or not, not part all, of it? No, not at all. No, no. Okay. Uh, just a couple questions, then. Um, so. There's this reform movement going on in Burma that's influencing Thailand. Well, the old, the old reform movement. The old reform movement. Um, and I heard some mention of through the centuries, Sri Lanka, Burma, and Thailand had some of this exchange mm -hmm. going on at points that they would send different people over to kind of reform the movement. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you can speak a little bit about that. But uh, my question then is, um, according to sort of what you're saying is awakening is awakening. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the Buddha's awakening of the Buddha's time because that was that time. But mm -hmm. once this, the wheel was turned, 
the it awakening of beings has been pretty uh, continuous. Um, so that really connects the Buddhist teachings are these beings who awaken, you know, become awakened as a result of the teachings and then they practice and give their teachings the way they're giving them. But the, the awakening stays pure and the same. Yeah, even and though I mean, the awakening is awakening across the board. Um, I've talked to a couple of the Forrester Johns who say one of the realizations that comes with arahantship is that there, the world has never been empty of arahants since the time of the Buddha. Okay. So it has been kind of a, you know, a living tradition that's going on. So that's what's really carrying over the teachings mm -hmm. and, and the, the basics out of those and who learns them and spreads them and mm -hmm. the, the text and whatnot are uh, really sort of uh, manifestations as pure, as unpure, yeah, those who are You, you can't really them. write a history of awakening. You can write a history of what the scholars had to say in this generation, what the scholars had to say in that generation, because they were the ones who were writing things down. But you know, you know, who were the actual monks and nuns who were lay people who were getting awakening? There's no history of that. There's no way. They don't leave traces, really. So, so we have their students. As well, we have this tradition where worse. the students you know, started writing down the teachings. And of course, it happened at a time when mass media were coming in. It was the John Munn, there were, no, there were no tape recordings available with the John Lee. The very last year of his life, tape recordings started coming in. We have a couple tape recorded talks by John Lee with the John Mahabua. We have this huge amount of tape recorded talks. So it's a very unusual tradition in a sense that has left this kind of record behind. Okay, let's move on to John Munn. He was born in 1870, died in 1949. Just goes straight to his teachings. Two of the teachings that he emphasized more than the others. And part of the problem of you figure out what a John Munn taught lies in the fact that, um, as I said, only two written pieces are, remain from his work or his teachings. And so a lot of this is what we learn from his students and students who people who live with him, people who studied directly with him. They would say, "You know, this is this is what he taught me. This is what he taught in general." You will also find that in the written record, when a John Lee and a John Mahabua talk about a John Mun, they will talk about the teachings that they received directly from him. In a John Lee's case, um, he wrote a book, Craft of the Heart, very shortly after his time with a John Mun. My, my assumption is a lot of that book came from a John Munn. There's also the book Frames of Reference. It's his book on um, the establishing of mindfulness. It doesn't read like a, a John Lee's other writings. And we do know that he visited a John Munn very close to a John Munn's death. And John Mahabua tells the story that a John Lee came, and with a few days he was there at his last visit. He said, I heard Dharma out of a John Munn I never heard ever before. Um, um, and so we know that John Lee came back and wrote down frames of reference soon after his visit with the John Munn. So there's some, I have some you know, feeling that a lot of the John Munn is in that book. Um, so his basic teachings, in addition to the, some of the writings that we'll be looking at, the Dharma, practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma and the traditions of the Noble Ones. These were repeated themes that he would teach. In other words, you have to bring your practice, or bring your attitudes, bring your um, behavior your views and everything in line with the Dharma as it is, as opposed to trying to bring the Dharma in and try to make it yours. In other words, adjust it to fit what, you, what your preconceived notions are. He was often accused of behaving in a way that, or practicing in a way that was not Thai or Lao. You know, just going against Thai culture, going against Lao culture, the old ways of doing things that had become common. He said he wasn't interested in practicing in line with like Tao, Thai culture or Lao culture. He was interested in practicing in line with the culture of the noble ones. Because if you want to become a noble one, that's the culture you have to practice. So, you know, the idea that the Dharma has to be brought in line with a particular culture. Um, I remember John Fuang would, talk, he would mention that every now and then. He would say it with a very snide, sarcastic voice. Uh, just the idea that she would try to bring things in line with a particular culture did not appeal to him at all. And that was very much against the traditions the practice of the, of the forest tradition. The traditions of the noble ones, these appear twice 
in the literature. Once is in the commentaries, once is in the canon. Um, in the canon, it's the, the four traditions of the Noble Ones are that you are content with any whatever robes you have, content with any food you have, content with any shelter you have. Um, and at the same time, you realize that there is danger even in the contentment and that you might grow proud about that. So you have to work on that too. The fourth one is being finding delight in developing skillful qualities and delight in abandoning unskillful qualities. Now this goes against the grain for us. Now, most of us like our greed, aversion, and delusion, and giving them up is difficult. Um, sitting all night in meditation does not come easily, um, but you have to learn how to delight in the fact that you are learning how to do this and you're pushing yourself. Um, the concept of the traditions of the Noble Ones also comes in the passages in the commentary where the Buddha, after his awakening, returns home to Kabilavastu. And the first day he's back, he goes out for alms. And the king, his father, comes down and says, How can you do this? No one in our family tradition has ever gone for alms. This is disgraceful. And in the commentary story says of the Buddha Ripara that I no longer belong to that family tradition. I, no lo I now belong to the traditions of the Noble Ones. So in both cases, these teachings go against the grain of our normal, normal attitudes, our normal, normal tendencies. And they also go against the idea that the Dharma should be squeezed into fit with a particular culture. The notion of practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma appears in the Mahabharata Nibbana Sutta, where the Buddha is saying that it's if, as long as if, if you want to really pay homage to the Buddha, you practice the Dharma in line with the Dharma. And he says, as long as we do that, the world will not be empty of arahants. In other parts of the canon, the Buddha explains what that means: is you practice for the sake of dispassion, you practice for the sake of disenchantment. Now, that doesn't sound all that attractive. But you have to realize you know, the basic metaphor that the Buddha used many times throughout his, his teachings was that we suffer because we're feeding on things. And in order to stop feeding, we have to develop the kind of hunger or lack of hunger that wouldn't cause us to feed. And to get, develop that lack of hunger, we have to develop a sense of disenchantment with the things that we're feeding on, um, disenchantment with the, and dispassion with the things that we're feeding on. So this is practice for the sake of dispassion, practice for the sake of nirvana. The people who learned of Ajahn Mun's practice and were inspired by precisely this aspect, that he was really practicing for the sake of nirvana. There was nothing else that was involved in what he was representing, both in his teachings and in his actual behavior. Um, several years back, when I was back in Thailand for Ajahn Sawat's funeral, I was asked to give a Dharma talk. And you know me, I don't like giving very long Dharma talks. Um, have you ever listened to anything on dharmatalks.org? It's very rare, rare that a Dharma talk lasts more than 20 minutes. They were hoping for an hour talk. Um, and I basically talked about my time with Ajahn Sawat and that these were the two teachings that he had carried over when he came to the States, was teachings on the traditions of the Noble Ones, teaching on the Dharma in line with the Dharma. Wrapped up the talk pretty quickly, got down from the Dharma seat, went back to my hut. I found out later that they invited another John to kind of fill up the time that was remaining. And he gets up in the Dharma seat and says, well, that Western monk just said everything that was really worth saying. <laughs> So those are, the, those are the themes of the forest tradition. Traditions of the Noble Ones, practice, practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma. A couple of other themes that come out through John Mun's teachings and his life is that the whole idea of refuge is very important. That you're out in the wilderness, you don't have much protection aside from the fact that you believe that this practice itself is going to protect you. So their, their sense of going out into nature was not that nature was a nice, warm, all-enveloping place. I mean, if it's going to envelop you, it was going to eat you. Um, you had to be very wary of and very heedful as you went into the forest. So this is one of the reasons why they went into the forest, was that it would teach you heedfulness. And also that sense of danger that would come from being in the forest would keep you alert and keep you on your toes. Um, John Munn was renowned for psychic powers, primarily his ability to read people's mind. His primary teachings were the Four Noble Truths and the Four Establishings of Mindfulness. Um, we'll get into more detail on that when we talk about John Lee. He also taught that it's the nature of mind is to be primarily active. There's a passage in that poem that he wrote where he talks about the mind being like a river. And the mind is, there's like the source part of the mind which keeps flowing out to its objects. And so it's not that the mind is a passive recipient of things coming in and then reacts to them. It's going out looking for trouble, basically. 
this is a constantly recurring theme throughout the teachings of the forest tradition, that we're not just here registering impact of the senses and noting, 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 letting it go. We have to look at the, what takes sense to which actually we're going out looking for trouble. The mind feels lust and it's looking for something to feel lustful about. It's looking for something to get angry about. You need to test this. Why do we have hate radio? People want to hate something. Okay, they turn on Rush Limbaugh. You know. um, so one of the basic understandings of the mind is that it is a primarily active factor in causing its own suffering. A third theme that he, we find repeatedly in people's reports of their time with the John Mun was that there was a very close interrelationship between virtue, concentration, and discernment. Now there's a tendency, and here we'll be finding many times when a John Mun is going against what was becoming the, the Bangkok orthodoxy. There was a group of um, textbooks that were produced in Bangkok around the beginning of the 20th century, um, which became kind of the standard text for monks to study. I had to study them when I was a new monk. They're still there. Um, they haven't been changed since the 19, 1910s. The senior monks in Bangkok say, well, if we change the text, it would be a sign of disrespect for our great teachers in the past. Um, even though every generation coming up says, you can't read this, it's, it's old time. Um, and in the textbooks they, they say, okay, you first you practice your virtue, and then your virtue gets pure, and then you practice concentration, and concentration is good, and then you dis develop your discernment. And John will say, it doesn't work that way. You develop all three together, um, and your concentration will help your virtue, your discernment will help your virtue, your discernment will help your concentration. There's an interaction among these three. In fact, as we're going through the day, I'll be focusing mainly on these three aspects of the path, virtue, concentration, discernment, plus release. These are the areas where the, the distinctive teachings of the forest tradition. These four teachings, virtue, concentration, discernment, release, are called the noble dhammas. And they give you a good framework for understanding exactly where the forest tradition stands on these things. For example, in the textbooks that were being written at the time, Virtue seemed primarily as a matter of word and deed. In other words, you just behave in line with the precepts. And John Munn was saying, no, it's primarily a matter of the mind, because it's the mind is giving the intention, it's creating the intention, that actually de determines whether a particular deed is going to be against the precept or, or, or in line with the precepts. The problem with seeing precepts primarily as just an issue of your behavior is it tends to ritualize the precepts, and what you, you learn, you follow the rules, you follow the rules and you're going to be okay. Or you follow the letter of the rule, you're okay. Um, there is a tendency, um, and this, is, this goes way back in Thai culture, to view, okay, after I've taken the precepts, I now have virtue, <laughs> until I break them, and then I go back and I take the precepts again. I actually know, some, I know of some criminals who, before they robbed a bank, would go and take the precepts because they felt it would protect them. <laughs> so that's what comes out if you view the precepts as you know, just an issue of a kind of a ritual sort of thing. But for John Munn, it's, it's primarily an issue of the mind. It's primarily an issue of looking at your intention. And the whole purpose of virtue is, is, is as a training of the mind. In connection with this, in addition to the five precepts, there's also training through the monk's protocols in the Vinaya. There's a whole series of protocols having to do with how the teacher treats the student, how the student treats the teacher, what a visiting monk does when he comes to a monastery, what a monk does before he leaves the monastery, how he cleans his hut while he's staying at the monastery. There are 14 of these sets of what they call protocols altogether. And these are a very major part of the forest monk's training. Again, coming from Bangkok at the time was a new veneer uh, guide, which was basically saying that these protocols are a little out of date now, maybe we can just kind of put a lot of them aside. Um, they, they deal with very minor affairs. Uh, John Munn's uh, observation was that sometimes it's the little things that can cause the most trouble. He says, you know, it's very rare that you're going to get a whole log in your eye, but it's very easy to get a piece of sawdust in your eye and to blind you. And so you, you have to be very careful about the specifics. So in being scrupulous about observing these protocols, you develop your mindfulness. And his way of teaching people this, and you saw, if you read any of the passages in advance, you saw that passes by a John Lee, where he says, you know, a John Munn was very strict about where things should be put and telling me <coughs> when I was doing it wrong, but he wouldn't tell me what the right places were. Which meant that you have to observe. 
And when Ajahn Mun did things, how do you do it? Now, if you're cleaning his room, you've got the problem is he would go in the room, shut his door. And how do you know how he placed things? John Lee's duty was to clean up the room and put it in an order, and every time Ajahn Mun said, you're not putting in the right order. I wouldn't tell him what the right order was. So fortunately for John Lee, they were living in banana leaf huts. So he poked a hole <laughs> in, the, in the wall of a John Mun's hut, and he you know, straightened out the room as best he could, and then he went out, and John Mun came to the room, and John Lee was peeking through the hole, and then John Mun placed this here and placed that there. And then John Mun leads, okay, that's where this goes. The whole purpose of this is to train your powers of observation. Because as a meditator, especially if you're going to go out in the forest individually, you can't have your teacher there telling you all the time what to do. You have to figure things out on your own. And the best way to do that is through having practice in use, using your powers of observation. I can tell you that that was the same training I got from John Fuang. This is in the wrong place. That's in the wrong place. You're doing this wrong. No explanation of how it can be done right. I didn't have the advantage. His, his room had wooden walls. <laughs> so I had to figure out other ways of observing. And it's through being observant that you develop your discernment. Um, this combination of mindfulness, through scrupulously following the rules, and being observant in learning how to be trained to observe for yourself, um, connects with a concept that was very basic to the forest tradition, which is a combination of mindfulness and discernment. You'll see this many times in the forest writings. They put these two words together. It happens, so happens that this combination, sati, which is the word for mindfulness, and banya, which is the word for discernment, Sati Panya in Thai, as a Thai idiom, means intelligence. You're both mindful and you're discerning. That's how you're intelligent. Uh, and John Fuang also made a comment, which I'm sure he picked up from a John Mun, which is that respect is also a sign of intelligence. If you're going to learn something from somebody, you show them respect. If you show disrespect, they're not going to want to teach you. So you know, we, were, we were raised in American high schools where it was the, you know, the intelligent students were disrespectful to the teachers. Very different attitude over there. Okay. Now that's the issues on around virtue, around concentration. And John Mun taught that jhana practice is available to practitioners even now. Uh, this, as I said, was opposed to the orthodoxy coming out of Bangkok. He also taught that your concentration topic must be congenial to the individual. There's no single wilderness tradition method. You know, like in some, some Vipassana methods, you have the method of this teacher, you have the method of that teacher. The forest tradition does not, does not have a single method. Uh, John Munn would try to figure out which was the most congenial topic for a particular student and advise, advise him or her to follow that, that topic. One of the ways of bringing the mind to concentration that he taught was to develop a sense of sangwega. So it's not just a step where you just follow your breath to look at this, but you also have to have a sense of... Sangwega is this sense that Life as you normally live it and the things that you're normally attached to really lead you open to danger. And most, in many cases, normal life is pretty meaningless. We just, we just go around and around and around. We, get, we latch on to things that are going to disappoint us. And having that attitude makes it easier for the mind to drop any of the disturbances or hindrances that would pull you away from concentration and kind of bring you back to your topic. He also taught that um, tranquility or calm, samatha, and Vipassana or insight are not radically separate. The two practices have to go together. Um, an analogy that John Lee gives, which I think he picked up from a John Mun, which is that with concentration practice or samatha practice, you cut down a forest, and with Vipassana, you take those same trees and you burn them. In other words, as you're getting, getting the mind into concentration, you cannot get the mind into concentration without some discernment. You have to see, okay, what, what are the problems that my mind is having right now? What are the issues? How can I, again, using your ingenuity, being observant, how do I deal with these problems? So there has to be some element of discernment in your concentration. At the same time, for, for discernment to be really precise and to really get to the details of what's going on in your mind, you have to have solid concentration. So the two go together, and they're actually... It's like learning how to do something, and then you learn how to observe yourself doing it. It's the same thing that you're doing. It's the same, you know, when they say that you're practicing meditation, they just use the word gamatana or doing samadhi. But in doing samadhi, it's both samatha and vipassana that go together. And it's just that as you get more and more practice at it, you begin to learn how to observe yourself better, what you're doing. So the two practices are not separate. Now, John Munn 
had a tendency, was, when his mind was settling down, to have lots and lots of visions. In fact, this is what he became famous for when, when his biographies came out. A lot of it had to do with Ajahn Mun's visions, which caused some trouble, which we'll talk about later on. Um, what's interesting is from what Ajahn Fuang told about his time with Ajahn Mun was he, he was taught you do not trust your visions. Because you can imagine someone out practicing the forest alone, a vision comes up. If you believe everything that comes into your mind, you're going to go crazy. And so this is, I think, one of the most amazing things about John Mun is he did not go crazy practicing alone in the forest. He was able to figure out, okay, if a vision comes, what is the Dharma lesson here? And then the quick, quick next section is, okay, does the Dharma lesson here fit in with what I already know about the Dharma? Does it sound like it's reasonable? If it does, then we put it to the test. You actually put it into practice, and then you judge what the results are. This is kind of, you know, in the principle of the Galama Sutta. You, you, you don't believe things, you don't believe things just because they come from what seems to be an authoritative source. You actually have to put them to test in your practice. And one of the best ways of, of protecting yourself from getting sucked in by a vision or something like that is just to stay with this basic sense of awareness. Now this, um, in Thai they call this puru. You'll sometimes see this translated as the one who knows, or what knows, or bare awareness, or um, awareness itself. What this is, is a state of mind that can be attained through concentration. There's some confusion about this. Sometimes they say that just this awareness itself that you get, can get to through a concentrated state is the awakened mind. It's not. But it is a state where you have a sense, okay, you have this awareness and there's the object of your awareness. They separate out on their own. And so when an object comes up in the meditation or a vision comes up in the meditation, your best protection against getting sucked in by it is to get with this sense of just awareness itself. And watch what this is doing. Sort of pull yourself away. And that's one of your protections from getting sucked in by these kinds of things. As for his teachings on, dis more advanced teachings on discernment and release, he would say that there is a stage in the path where all Four Noble Truths become one. Um, what this means is that when you look at the Four Noble Truths, they have four different duties. Each truth has a specific duty. You know, suffering is to be comprehended, its cause is to be abandoned, the cessation of suffering is to be realized, and the path is to be developed. And as you're doing your practice, you're basically you're doing all four of these things so switching around these duties together, there will come a point, he says, he says, that when all of them come together as just one truth, i.e. something to be abandoned, that at that point even the path gets abandoned. We're not here to attain right view. Remember, right view is a part of the path. It's part of the, you know, the way to awakening. But to get to awakening, even right view has to be put aside at some point. Secondly, his, you know, he said, at the state of full awakening, it is not devoid of consciousness. And this was this was an issue that caused him some some concern because his after he had some of the noble attainments, he was you know had been reading the text coming out of Bangkok, and they said you know that basically awakening is a blank out. I mean, there's no consciousness in awakening at all, and yet here he had been able to he's, question. I seemed to have let go of everything. And yet there's still an awareness there. He went and checked with his friend, who was that senior monk in Bangkok, who was also a scholar, and tended, who fortunately was not, did not buy into the orthodoxy that was coming out of Bangkok at the time. He checked around in the canon, and sure enough, there are passages in the canon that talk about an awakened awareness, awakened consciousness. One of his other statements, which we'll be getting to in one of the readings, is that Nirvana does not equal the Third Noble Truth. The Third Noble Truth is the step to Nirvana. It's the point at which Nirvana is realized. But the Nirvana itself lies beyond the Four Noble Truths. And this also relates to an important distinction that you will see throughout the forest tradition, is that in the commentaries they will make a distinction between conventional language and ultimate language. In other words, conventional language we talk about there being people in this room, in ultimate language you say there are aggregates in this room or there are sense media in this room, or there are elements in this room. From a John Munn's point of view, both levels of language are conventional. And he, and he would contrast those with the actual experience of relief, w release, which lies outside of even, even the, the, the terms of right view. In this case, he's, he's following the, the use of, there's the word bhadamatta, which 
the commentaries interpret as meaning ultimate language, Bhartamatta appears in the Pali Canon to mean release. So even the teachings of the Buddha are on the level of conventional reality. They're useful conventions for the sake of release, but even at, at the point of release, even those get put aside. So those are John Munn's basic teachings on virtue as basically an issue of the mind, concentration as being one open and also necessary for the path. Um, lack of division or lack of clear distinction between samatha and vipassana. And then this the teachings on how even the Four Noble Truths are to be put aside in awakening. Any questions on any of that? Right there, there's this book by Paul Griffiths called Mindlessness, mm -hmm. the Buddhist uh, mind-body problem, whatever. I mean, and then other people write that too, that uh, Rod Bucknell and St uh, Martin Stewart Fox, the people who are responsible for the light jhanas, that uh, uh, the fourth jhana or the eighth jhana, whatever, is absolute death. It's absolute obliteration of consciousness. No. At least not from the point of view of the forest tradition. And there's no support for that in the canon either. Mm -hmm. Now, the commentaries, I neglected to mention that it was, um, mentioned that it was under Rama V that the commentaries started being brought back into town and being seriously studied. I think the forest tradition was fortunate. It was there at a time when the canon had been rediscovered, but the commentaries were not yet regarded as authoritative. Oh, really? Yeah. It's kind of a little window in time. No Vasudhi Maga. Um, <laughs> John Munn had some pretty sharp things to say about the Vasudhi Maga. <laughs> yes. Okay. You can go first. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between a vision and a thought? Okay, visions come at you with this sense of it's a, it's a full reality being presented to you. You know, so you, you, you can think about devas, but if you actually see a deva appearing in front of you, watching a movie, it's like a it's like you're watching a movie and you're not in control. And the vision comes, and there's a strong sense, and again, that could be coming from within, and it could be coming from without, which is another one of the reasons why you don't give credence to visions. But he talked about his visions. He talked about that. He would talk about his visions, turned out only to people who were having similar problems. I mean, he was, according to John Fuang, he was very private about his visions. And John Fuang was another meditator who tended to have lots of visions. And then John Munn came down and really hard for talking about his visions to other people. He said, You talk about your visions with your teacher, nobody else. Now, what happened, of course, is that people were having visions, you know, issues. You know, David came and told me to do this, and the John Munn said, well, I had a David come and appear me and tell me to do that, and this is what happened um, when I tried to actually put that into practice. Now, that got remembered, and when people were going around you know, collecting stories about a John Munn and his practice, this would get reported to the people collecting. That's how they got into the, into the, into the biographies. So a vision can be positive or negative? Yeah, I mean, it can be true or false. Just fooling around with you. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and your mind might be fooling around with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a question over here. Yeah. What is the difference, Jean, uh, between a vision and a fantasy? Again, you've got it. You've got to test it in just the same way. In other words, I mean, you can you can have it, it, visions are kind of like dreams. And again, how much can you trust your dreams? But occasionally, every now and then, there comes a dream that which gives you some useful information. And so, this is why you have to, as I say, filter filter the vision, how, what how, what you're going to take away from it. Now, by and large, as John Munn would say, if, if he was teaching someone who was not right with him, he'd say, let your visions go. You said something about the um, awakening being beyond the Four Noble Truths. Mm -hmm. Could you say more about that? Could you explain look that? At, you look at the definition of the Third Noble Truth, and it basically is the abandoning of craving. So that's the activity that would lead to awakening. So it's, it's the act of 
getting to the point where you will realize nirvana. But the nirvana itself is something outside that. Because as John Munn says, the Third Noble Truth has an activity associated with it. It's something that's got to be realized. Whereas nirvana, there's no activity. But nirvana is the realization. So it's like the twelve um, permutations that the, um, that, that uh, realization has been made or really, really, well, that all the abandoning of craving has been realized and then the next step is the experience of nirvana you can see this is one of the reasons why the forest tradition was something of an anti-scholastic movement because there's a tendency among scholars to want to say okay we've got reality pinned down in our words we've got the net that covers everything and the forest is just tradition was saying no there is an area that's beyond language that's beyond even the Four Noble Truths. But in reality, the awakened mind is continually um, reinforcing what the no Noble Truth is, isn't it? Yeah, the awakened mind is doing one thing, but the, the nirvana itself is not the same thing as the awakened mind. Hmm. In fact, that you have a mind that's still functioning in, in, in the world after awakening. That's part of the, you know, the, the, the fuel remaining, and you know, when they have nirvana with fuel remaining and nirvana with no fuel remaining. When you hit the point where there's no fuel remaining, there's no activity at all. The nirvana with no fuel remaining is par nirvana, isn't it? Yeah, that's a after death, yeah. yeah. It's over here. Oh, move the mic around. Um, thank you for your uh, teachings today. Um, what is the difference between having a vision and insight or problem solving? Like when I'm meditating or I'm in a quiet space, mm -hmm. a vision feels external. Uh -huh. But when I feel insight and I get that, you know, and really is that aha feeling, it's like to trust that. No, you can't trust either one. How do I... How do I how do I challenge that that aha feeling, that insight feeling? Okay. Um, John Lee has really good advice. And he says, if you get an insight like that, ask yourself, okay, to what extent is this not true? To what extent is the opposite true? So you don't go just you know down the road in one direction. And then you compare what your insight was with what you know of the Dharma. And if it seems reasonable that it fits in line with then you say, the next thing you've got to do is test this. What would this mean in practice? How would this apply to my actual decisions in life? And test it. Say, okay, if I actually follow this, what comes about as a result? So it needs to, it needs to be tested. If a vision comes three times, you tend to take it a little bit more seriously than if it comes once. I remember being with a John Fuang. If something happened in my meditation once, he said, I'm not interested yet. <laughs> I, just, I just repeated what she said. Yeah. 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 I'm not done. So whether it comes from within or comes from without, you've got to test it. You can't trust everything that comes up in a, in a concentrated mind. And if, if it's a kind of vision that it doesn't really make any difference in terms of your behavior, you say, well, that's interesting, just put it aside. Ginan Ayon has an interesting test, which is, when you have an insight like that, look at what your next mind state is after the insight. If you kind of grab onto it, okay, you made a mistake. Yeah. Um, what about the kind of ex spiritual experience, what category is that in? Is that a vision type or? No, it's not a vision. It's not a vision. So if I have a, like a burning bush experience, mm -hmm. this is not a vision. I can trust that. Mm -hmm. Okay, even if it's the burning bush sitting in front of you, you say, well, you know, who's playing with me? Real insight is when you begin to see your own mind's activity in, in the course of saying, oh, this is how I'm creating suffering. And I don't have to do it. Because again, it keeps coming back, you've got the, the John Munn, it's, it's the activity of the mind that's causing the problem. And so you want to keep constantly referring back to, what is my mind doing right now? And what are the results of what I'm getting? And am I doing something, if it's, if it's causing stress, 
There must be another way. Okay, so for example, mm -hmm. if I have a sense of sacredness of things, mm -hmm. uh, that everything's sacred, even pumping gas in my car, mm -hmm. how is that related to the vision or the... How is that... How would you categorize this experience? Okay, then the question would be, okay, what difference will this make in my behavior if I see everything as sacred? Much, a lot. Mm -hmm. But the next question is, where am I going to go to the bathroom? The same. Okay, now we got a problem. You could see that everything should be taken seriously, everything should be done carefully. The question of whether things are sacred or not, maybe that's not the issue. Maybe the issue is, how do I treat the things in my life? How careful am I about my actions and the consequences of my actions? That would be something you would say, okay, that's worth looking into. Uh -huh. Okay. And another question. Mm -hmm. um, Let's say there is a big opening, not opening, big insight into the nature of suffering. Mm -hmm. Let, let's say big in the sense of I can see that all my actions throughout my life have been motivated by this particular defilement, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like maybe pleasing my mother. Mm -hmm. Everybody I met in my life happened to be the person I wanted to please, mm -hmm. just like I wanted to please my mother. Mm -hmm. And I finally saw through that and um, it was very painful because it meant to me that I have to change the relationships I'm in. And still there is a pull to do the same thing, and there is knowing that this, where it leads, this leads to suffering that I was. And I, so this is like, the recognition would be the first noble truth, the actual, the the seeing that I, I, if I don't do that, this won't happen, mm -hmm. would be the second noble truth, right? Mm -hmm. The third would be this, there is a way out. If I continue practicing, I would not have to suffer, mm -hmm. let's say in this area of my life or mm -hmm. all my life. And then staying away from engaging in the same behavior would be the path, um, you know, mm -hmm. right? That's. I'm trying to explain it in terms of Four Noble right, Truths. Right, yeah, okay. What you've got here is, there's also the question of, okay, you, you have the insight, but you find yourself being drawn back to the same pattern of behavior again. You said, I haven't really completed the duty with regard to that Noble Truth. I haven't really fully comprehended it. When the Buddha talks about comprehension, especially about our behavior that leads to suffering, he says you have to look at, okay, what's the allure, what are the drawbacks? Now, mm -hmm. you, what you saw was the drawbacks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Now the next question is, well, why do I keep going back? What's the, and that there's something in there that wanting to please somebody it feeds something in your mind. Right, I hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've got to look at that more carefully. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question here. Um, so detailed question. You mentioned that Ajahn Mun said concentration topic must be um, congenial to the individual. So how does one go about I mean, we're normally given the breath. Mm -hmm. uh, how does one go about exploring different okay. topics? And okay. um, you'll find that there's, the breath is good for dealing with some issues in the mind, but others are recalcitrant. They're not, they're not responding to the breath. And that's when we say, okay, let's... Uh, John Lee's approach was that your breath is home base. Or as he said, this is your home as a meditator. And then you have places where you forage other meditation topics. You know, you've got lust coming up and the breath is not doing anything for lust. You say, well, maybe I need to contemplate the body, maybe I need to contemplate death. Um, so you can you switch, you can switch you the can topics switch. You, don't have, you don't have just one topic for life. It's good to have, and, um, like, you know, like, like a carpenter, you need a toolbox full of tools. If all you have is a hammer, you're not gonna build a house. So if a topic is continuing, you're not making really much progress with it. You look for another right. way mm -hmm. of right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exploring that. Mm -hmm. That might yeah. pierce it. Now you have uh, other teachers in the forest tradition. Say, in the case of a Mahabhu, he really, he really responded to just repeating Bhutto, Bhutto, Bhutto as his meditation topic. And that just kind of nailed his mind down. I don't respond to that particular topic. John Fu Young said he, you know, he, he could his mind go buto, 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 and he's thinking all kinds of things as he's going buto, buto, buto. It just did not do it for him. So that's another way of testing it. 
And so the, the point is, is your mind being concentrated? Is your mind getting concentrated with this? Okay. If, if it isn't, try something else. Try something else. But give it a fair test, you know. Otherwise you flit around, nothing works, and then you're off to, you know, who knows what. <laughs> Okay, let's look at some of the readings. This book called The Heart Released was put together by a couple of Ajahn Mun's students who had something of a scholarly background and they were interested particularly in the areas where Ajahn Mun's teachings did not fit in with what was being sent, was, was being taught in Bangkok. So for instance, our hunts of no matter what sort reach both release through concentration and release of discernment free from effluence in the present. No distinctions are made saying that this or that group reaches release only through concentration or only through discernment. In other words, you need both. In particular, you need right concentration. Here he's going against the idea that you can have dry insight. Explanation given the commentators that release through concentration pertains to those arahants who develop concentration first, while release through discernment pertains to the dry insight arahants who develop insight exclusively without having first developed concentration runs counter to the path. The eightfold path has, he doesn't say it, but it, it has eight folds, includes both right view and right concentration. The next passage I think is one of the more interesting ones. Is that the Four Noble Truths, suffering, its cause, its cessation, the path to its cessation, are activities and that each truth has an aspect that has to be done. Suffering has to be understood, its cause abandoned, its session, cessation made clear, the path to its cessation developed. All these are aspects that have to be done. If they have to be done, they must be activities. So we conclude that all four truths are activities. Okay. This is in line with the verse quoted above, which I did not include in the quote. Um, which speaks of the four truths as feet or stair treads or steps that must be taken for the task to be finished. What follows is thus termed activity activitylessness, like writing the numerals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, then erasing the one through nine, leaving just zero, and not writing anything more. What is left is read as zero, but doesn't have any value at all. You can't use it to add, subtract, multiply, or divide with any other numerals, and yet at the same time you can't say that it doesn't exist, for there it is, zero. Um, notice this image he's taking from, from arithmetic, and John Lee is going to turn it around later on in the readings. So the point here is the point we were making earlier, that once nirvana is attained, it flies outside of the Four Noble Truths, because there is no activity related to it. And he says the answer is, uh, when supposing is entirely destroyed, that's the word samati. Um, which is sometimes translated as conventional truth or conventional reality. Um, but in Thai, the word, sam the word s samadhi is pronounced samut is also used when you say, suppose something, and you say samut ba. So there's a sense that these things are kind of supposed into being. Um, in other words, even the Four Noble Truths are on the level of supposing, they're still on the level of, which, or may be also translated as convention. With the words erasing or destroying the activity of supposing, the question arises, when supposing is entirely destroyed, where will we stay? The answer is that we will stay in a place that isn't supposed, right there with activity of lessness. Any questions on that? I'm sorry. Okay. We've got 20 minutes. <laughs> I wanted to get a John Munn done before lunch. You know? <laughs> so, okay. Sorry. Okay, we talked earlier about how even you know, for the commentators there is conventional language and there is ultimate language, which is a true description of reality. And John Munn is saying both are used as tools and therefore they are all supposed into being for a particular purpose. Now we're talking about human beings, we use those supposings. You know, if I wanted, uh, John Cha has a great example of this. You know, so, you know, if I wanted to have, wanted to call you, call your attention, I would call your name. I wouldn't just say person, 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 because you know, they would get everybody in the room, you know, or nobody. So I have to know your name, which is a convention. And it's in the same way where John Munn is making the point that even the teachings like the Five Aggregates, the Four Noble Truths, these are conventions that we use for the purpose of the path, and then they get put aside with the final attainment.
I mean, this fits in with the, the, poly, the canon's image of the, the raft. You take the raft over to the other side of the river, but you don't hold on to it when you continue walking. So. Okay. The next passage. So the earnest meditator comes to analyze things down in line with their inherent nature, seeing that sabe sankara cha, sabe sankara dukkha. Acts of mental fabrication, the conditions of the mind, are what is inconstant. The world of living beings is constant, simply the way it is. No, 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 he's saying the problem lies here. It doesn't lie with the world outside. When the Buddha is talking about you know, sabe sankara, he's talking about the sankaras of the mind, mental fabrications. Now the things out there, they're not the problem. It's the mind that goes out and is trying to you know, place its labels on things, place its attachments on things. That's the, that's the troublemaker. It's on inside here. Analyze these things in terms of the Four Noble Truths as a way of rectifying the conditions of the mind. So you can see for certain in your own right that these conditions of the mind are inconstant and stressful. And you're observing yourself, the mind as it relates to the world. And the fact that you haven't seen in your own right that they are inconstant and stressful is why you have fallen from mental fabrications. In other words, you believe everything your mind tells you. When you truly see this, it will rectify the conditions of the mind. The realization will come to you as sankara sasata nati. There are no mental fabrications that are permanent and lasting. Mental fabrications are simply conditions of the mind, like mirages. As for living beings, they have been a constant feature of the world all along. Okay, in many places in the forest tradition, they will talk about the importance of your labels, the sanya that you place on things. These are the troublemakers. Once you say this is this and that that and you believe it and you jump on it, and then you create trouble. When you know both sides that living beings are simply the way they are and that mental fabrications are simply a condition of the mind that supposes them, then Titiputam, the primal mind that has no conditions, can gain release. Okay, there there is this primal mind. Now it's we'll be getting a little bit into this later on exactly what is the primal mind that has been here. And the question of is, is this kind of a sneaking in the idea of a self through the back door? Well, there is no label of self in that condition or that state of mind. As for the teaching that all phenomena or regularities of behavior are not self, how could they be the self? Their business is simply to arise the way they do. Thus the Buddha taught, Sabes Tamanata, all phenomena are not self. We as earnest meditators should investigate things to see them clearly in this way. You know, the mind is made to converge, enabling us to see truly and vividly along these lines in our own right, at the same time giving rise to the knowledge that accompanies this vision. Okay, you see these things. The vision here is not that, like a picture in the mind. It is actually seeing things as they're happening. And then there's a knowledge that comes based on that. This is what is meant by uttana gamani vipassana, clear insight leading to emergence. Okay, this, is the, this is the insight that leads you outside of the cycle. We should work at this stage until it is mastered and that we see truly and clearly, along with the full conversions of the mind and its concurrent knowledge. Now here again, it's the, it's the convergence of the mind, the mind really coming together, very deep concentration, and there's a knowledge that arises together. You know, as, as you're going through concentration, you find as you get deeper and deeper concentration, different levels of fabrication kind of peel away until you get to this final state where all the fabrications peel off. Okay, finally we come to the realization, this is the knowledge of no more birth. This is the last paragraph. This stage is not an assumption or a supposing. Again, this is something that lies beyond the limits of what language can describe. It isn't fabricated or conjectured into being, nor is it anything that can be obtained by wanting. Now, note, he, however, he goes on to say, it's something that appears, is, and knows entirely of its own accord. Okay, this quality of the mind is not something you can create. However, you can get there through practice. Notice he says, it can't be attained by wanting, but you have to want to practice to get there. So simply wanting is not going to get you there, but saying, okay, focusing my desire on the path of practice will get the results if you if you really do it. Intense, relentless practice in which we analyze things shrewdly on our own is what will cause it to appear of its own accord. So again, the path is something that you do, but this realization when it comes is something it's not done. It's something that's independent of doing. 
And in, in, until you get there, you don't realize the extent to which you are creating all your reality. Now, it's all, not created out of whole cloth, but it is created out of the raw material that you get from your past karma. Which means that there are some limitations. You know, you can't just say, okay, I'm just going to push my fist right through this table here. You can't, you can't create your reality that way. But there are the extent to which you are trying to, as you're trying to make sense out of reality, trying to figure out what can I get out of this, what's, what's the most uh, appropriate way of behaving, all of that falls aside. And you realize how deep that goes once you've reached that attainment. It goes a lot deeper. Your, your role in creating reality is a lot bigger than you thought. Any questions? We need a mic, you need a mic. Um, so as you were talking about, we, we get a realization or an understanding of reality. Is that when we finally figure out emptiness? Okay, emptiness has lots of different meanings. We could spend a whole day on the meanings of emptiness. Um, there's the emptiness of the mind when it's free from disturbances. There's the emptiness of any self in all the phenomena that you're that you're engaged with, um, and this, these there there'll be kind of levels of emptiness. But finally, when the mind is empty of defilement, that's the ultimate emptiness. Now the question of you know is is this empty of true of its of its own nature? That that question never comes up in the, in the Theravada. That's that's a Mahayana question. So emptiness is not a Theravadan emptiness, principle? It, emptiness is a Theravada principle, but it has its own meanings within the Theravada context, which are the three that I gave you just now. Empty of disturbance, like the mind when it gets into concentration. Empty of any sense of self in anything that you experience. And then emptiness of defilement, which is the mind of the Arahant. Okay. Thank Those you. three levels, yeah. Would you say that... Um, the primal mind is awareness? No. Okay. It, it's something that lies deeper. Okay. And there's a really nice passage in um, there's a, one of the books on the table back there. It's on um, John Cha's Still Flowing Water. And there was a recorded conversation where you know, somebody, someone finally put that question right to John Cha. And he said, oh, oh, because they were assuming that, you know, that your basic awareness, the awareness of, kind of that's there all the time, is the same thing as the awakened mind. So they asked him, is that the case? And, no, no, why would it be the case? <laughs> and we're fortunate, I, I know the monk who asked the question, and he was one of these monks who can like to ask questions all the time, constantly doubting. We're fortunate that he actually asked that question and it was recorded, the answer was recorded. This gives you another sense of how difficult it is to kind of get to what the Forest of Johns were teaching. If that hadn't been recorded, Uh, that word you, it's T I T T H E Buddha. Tite Buddha. Are you going to talk about that more? We will talk about it more, yeah. Good. I, I, I ran across that once and I was going to call you, but I never got around to it. Well, basically, it's, it's the state of mind that is you know, outside of convention. It appears very rarely, though. It's very rare. I mean, you don't, it's, it's not, a poly, it's not so in the polycanon. The writer said it was a very fundamental, essential term. I said, never seen it before. It's, you find it in John Munn's writing, and you find it in some of the writings of some of his students. Um, but again, it's, it's, an, it's their name for this state of the awakened mind, which lies outside of space, lies outside of time. So it's not you're just, you know, the puru is one thing, this, this kind of awareness is something else. You know, what knows is one thing, the state of awareness is something else. I can't, there's not much, much to tell, you know. <laughs> we, well, you can talk about how to get there. Which is what the purpose of talking is, but we can't say. I mean, it's not. It doesn't have play any role in the causal system at all. It, like it's not the ground of being. It's not like uh, bhavanga. No, it's not the bhavanga. The, the, the sort of and it's not the ground of being or anything. Um, the, 
to get into, as I mentioned earlier, some of the issues of translation. There is a translation of a John Cha talking about the ground of being in a book. I've, talk, I've asked many Thai people, how would you say ground of being in Thai? And they give me this blank look. And there's, it's just not, I mean, it's something that the translator inserted. It's another re reason why you have to be careful about reading these things in English. Anything else? We've got five minutes. <laughs> yes. One of the teachings was that a um, lot of suffering originates within. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, I understand that in theory, but when I see like the Syrian refugees, right, mm -hmm. so much their suffering is external or people getting tortured in prisons, yeah. like how would I explain it to them? <laughs> okay. First you would have to say, <laughs> get them out of that situation so you can actually talk to them. Because seeing the extent to which you are creating suffering out of a really bad situation is very, very difficult. You have to have a background to say, okay, I'm coming into a bad situation and I know that I have the choice to suffer or not to suffer from this bad situation. And that requires being able to step out of it for a while. And while they're in the situation, it's okay, let's see what we can do to help you. If you can't help them, this is where equanimity has to come in. But to get a person to where they can listen to this and benefit from the teaching, they have to be willing to step back and say, because a, a lot of the mind's suffering is just that, why are they doing this to me? And they're just adding more arrows. And the Buddha has the image of the, being shot by one arrow and then shooting yourself with another arrow. And I would act, I'd like to amend that a little bit. So you're people shooting themselves with lots and lots of arrows all the time. In addition, but but I can't I, mean, I can't of, tell them no, like, you can't you are originating your suffering because no, it doesn't it, feel like no it's right. saying that but you that, okay the situation outside is really bad we, we we admit that we see what we can do about it but at the same time there are ways that you can suffer less from the situation we offer that as an alternative thank you could you just say a little bit more about. Uh, this, um, uh, my role in creating my reality is a lot bigger than I think it is. It's a lot bigger than you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you think about you know, when, when the Buddha is describing dependent core rising, and there's all those stages that lead up to sensory contact, you're doing all that all the time. Even before you have you know, sights coming in the eyes, sounds coming in at the ears, smells, tastes, whatever coming in at you, the mind is already prepped itself. And if it does that in ignorance, it's going to lead to suffering. So you look at there's metal fabrication, verbal fabrication, bodily fabrication, all the factors of name, including your intention, perception, attention. You know, just the fact that you are primed to look for something in a particular situation or primed to interpret something in a particular way as you approach the situation your choice of what, what you're going to pay attention to and how you're going to interpret it when it comes, you're already primed. So everybody is primed differently. We're all primed differently and we're all doing it out of ignorance, which is why we're all suffering. And so the whole purpose of the meditation is to kind of get you back through those earlier stages. Oh, I'm doing this, I've done that. Like you can see this when you're dealing with, you know, distracting thoughts in your meditation. At first it seems like the thought is just coming up full-blown. And then as you get quicker and quicker in catching it, you begin to realize there are steps that you are going through in interpreting that. There may be kind of a little stirring at kind of the, the borderline between your awareness and your, your sense of the body. It's, it's, you can't, can't really at that point say whether it's really physical or mental, it seems to be kind of both. And you have the choice of pl placing a label on that. Say, oh, this is a thought about Rita. Or this is a thought about you know, the bakery, whatever. And then you run with it. There was a choice there. You have the choice not to interpret it that way. And part of you say, well, how am I going to live if I don't interpret things this way? You find that you can live very well. <laughs> but the mind has a sense of obligation. I've got to place labels on these things and I've got to, you know. 
identify and run with every thought that it comes in. There's this compulsion that we have. So, so at what point in that dependent co-arising does that kind of detailed self start to slip away? And it's when you start, start bringing to... knowledge to the process, and, and, and that's what, that's kind of the, if you want to get boiled dependent co-arising down to its simplest terms, is okay, if you bring ignorance to any of these steps, you're going to keep the cycle going. If you bring knowledge to any one of these steps, you can begin to cut through it. I mean, to begin with, you turn it into a path. You know, perception is used on the path. Attention, intention, all these factors are actually factors that are used on the path. And the difference is, are you doing with this now, with, with knowledge, or are you doing this with ignorance? Now, as I said earlier, the, the forest tradition tends to focus great attention on the factor of perception, and the labels you put on things. Because we tend to lie to ourselves. I mean, you know, a physical pain can get made, be made really, really a lot worse by the perceptions we apply to it. And if you apply different perceptions to it, it's not as bad. So is this in your one book where you're saying that you can take dependent co-arising at any point right. and work it, right. yeah. and it's starting to break and it the starts, chain? And it starts to unravel the chain. So, so would, you, would it be a recommended then you're working at one point all the time so you get familiar with that? Or <laughs> you, you can it? never tell where it's going to be, where, where the sudden aha comes through that helps really unravel things in a big way. So as long as you're working on one of those factors, you're bringing, you're bringing knowledge. knowledge to it. And then you may say, well, this factor is connected to that one over there, and then you follow that. Yes? Uh, did, did the uh, tradition uh, established by Ajahn Mona include uh, the compassion component or the devotional or practice of the Brahma oh. Viharas? Or okay, there's, um, in terms of the do? compassion, and John Munn would, you know, develop the Brahma Viharas every day three times. Right, right after waking up, right after his afternoon nap, and then right before going to bed at night. And just the fact that he was teaching so many people. And you know, they talk about how he'd get a message in the afternoon. The Davis wanted to visit him that night, so okay, he'd go to bed early and then wake up in the middle of the night, and Davis would come. It's it, compassion in in practice. I mean, the, the, you don't see them, the forest of the John's recommending that anybody spend the whole day doing metta meditation or the whole day doing Brahma Vihara meditation. But he says, make it the framework of your practice. In other words, your motivation. You're doing this for the sake, as I said, for your own true happiness, to help others find true happiness. You're, you want to find a happiness that's not harming anybody else. This, this is why you're meditating. And you always keep that in mind. There's also the strong belief in the forest tradition that when you spread thoughts of goodwill to people, if they're, it's like you're like a radio transmitter, if their receiver is good, they'll pick it up. You know, there's something else behind, beside compassion, Brahmavihara. Oh, devotional. devotional. <sighs> when you take the Buddha re as your refuge by going into the forest and say, okay, I'm going to depend on the Dharma to see me through. I mean, there was a lot of chanting. We did a lot of chanting. But at the same time, it was not the same, but like, like you have sometimes in in the monasteries in Bangkok, where they have it. You know, the, every, the group gets together as a group and they do their chants as a group every day on a regular schedule. They apparently staying with the John Mun. Each monk was expected to do his own devotional practice separately. But there's a very strong sense, as I said, you know, the best way to pay homage to the Buddha was to practice the Dharma in line with the Dharma. Now, this did not preclude. Bowing down, chanting, having a very strong sense of being devoted to what the Buddha was saying. Because you have to be really devoted to the Buddha in order to follow this. I mean, this is what the quality of faith and conviction is. This is what conviction means in, in Buddhism, i.e., conviction in the Buddha's awakening and the implications that has for you and how you're going to run your life. And someone came to one of the forest masters, and after reading about you know the, the, the Zen master says, kill the Buddha. And the master said, we don't do that in this tradition. <laughs> 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 However, I mean, my, my reading of that, you know, if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him, means don't believe every vision you get. Because you know? what if the Buddha comes up to you the road and says, you know, you've got to do XXX? You know, you've got to test that. You can't fully believe 
every, everything that comes to you that, that way. Yes, can you get the traveling mic? Just a few minutes ago, you said that um, when you're in pain, depending on what your perception is and how you deal with it, it can go for better or worse. Could you please talk a little bit about that? Okay, suppose a thought comes up and you say, this, this is a thought about my job. I mean physical pain, actually. Oh, to, to deal with that at the early stage, when it's just coming up as this kind of stirring, you know, if you get your breath in it, you can zap it. And it, it's kind of like a little knot that's beginning to form, you just zap it and it just releases. And when, I was, when I first mastered this stage, I felt it was like I was being a spider on a web. And this fly comes and it, you know, it catches on the web and I go out and take care of the fly and then I go back, then I go back to my little corner. You can do that with physical pain? It, with the physical pain, what you're doing is you're, you're dealing with the tension around the pain. And then you also do that to any thoughts that are coming up. So, do I have to believe this thought? No. Sometimes you use another perception to go with the pain, like one of my favorite ones is you're riding down the road. Now, the way we ordinarily approach pain is if we're sitting facing the front of the car and everything is coming at us, turn around. Get in the back seat, you know, one of those old station wagons where the back seat faces back. And as soon as you see the pain, realize it's going away. It's going away. It's going away. I'm not the target. And that changes your relationship to the pain. Okay, it's lunchtime. We will meet back here at 1. <laughs>